everyone, welcome to the Cognitive SEO Talks show. Um, today we have a special guest from Australia, Dan. He will uh, say more about him and he will introduce us in the world of content and content marketing and uh, SEO as he sees it uh, uh, in 2018. Dan, welcome and uh, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much. It's been a while since we've seen each other. It's a pleasure to be with you again. So I'm Dan I'm from Australia. I run a company called Dijon Marketing. That's all you need to know about me. If you need to find out more, you can Google it. Um, so yeah, I've been in the last uh, two to three years, I've been quite actively involved in understanding how people consume and use content online. And, uh, during this time, I've um, developed a whole range of new ideas and thoughts on how content should be structured um, and done in a context of user experience, usefulness, SEO, strategy, data, and all sorts of wonderful things to do with digital marketing. So I'm sure we'll cover a whole lot of interesting topics today. Yeah, um, we will. We will. Yeah. And. Um... What do you think is uh, unique in your approach about content and uh, when you're applying it to your, uh, to your clients, Deja? Absolutely nothing. But there's a catch, obviously. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so what's the catch? What is absolutely not unique about how I do content is that the method that I apply has been used for many, many years. Um, it's called Inverted Pyramid and it's been using in the world of journalism for quite a long time. Uh, we can talk about it uh, in detail, but essentially the TLDR version is, and that's an important term to remember, too long didn't read, that's the generation we live in, is start with the answer, with your big news deliver on the promise of your title. So if you say that you're going to say something in the title, then your first sentence should deliver on that promise. So explain the most salient points in your opening sentence. Don't delay, don't give your goodies halfway down the article or the bottom of the article. So the second thing is, once you've highlighted the main point of what you're trying to say, your main idea, then you go into the details to support the main notion, the main idea, the main discovery or the piece of news. Everything else that goes after that could be described as fluff. So main point, secondary items, tertiary information. Um, in essence, that's how content should be written for the web. Um, otherwise, people will simply not read it. Um, it's interesting because the research that um, I did was two decades after uh, Jacob Nielsen did his research and we've come come to the same conclusion. After surveying thousand online readers, um, I've come up with a percent that he did 20 years ago. It's 16%. Of 16% of readers actually read everything word for word. The rest will just skip. That's a big percent. <laughs> I think it's a big percent, 16%. You're, you're, you're uh, even skeptical you're about that. An in-depth in-depth article that has about five thousand words. If yeah. sixty percent of the of the readers are reading it completely, then it's a big, big achievement. How sad is that? How sad it is that you have to say that you're happy with some with sixteen percent of your audience actually reading the article that you put your yeah. It's the reality of. Uh... Of the web and the content and scanning and not reading and all the stuff so everything is very yeah, that's right the scanning is where it's at you know people will scroll all the way to the bottom of the article skip the skip the entire body of the article and go to the comments because often in the comments you can quickly get a 
summary of what the article is about mm -hmm. um, and and people people do that now this doesn't apply to written word this applies to basically every piece of content that doesn't get to the point that doesn't deliver um, on its promise um, including video and that's um, why we we've had that little chat before this <clears throat> live recording where I said let's not do a long intro because people will skip it anyway let's just get into the subject matter Okay. Um, and talk concrete things. Um, so what's unique? Other than following the inverted pyramid and, and being um, helpful in terms of format that uh, people expect, um, there are some other ancient tricks, but really ancient. And that is, one of them is put one idea or one thought into a paragraph. Don't bundle two ideas into a same paragraph. And this uh, goes back to what you mentioned about scanning. So imagine user is reading an article. They hit a paragraph of text in, within that article. Now, this paragraph is trying to sell itself to the reader. Please read me. And if the reader decides that this paragraph is starting with something that they're not interested in, they will automatically skip to the next paragraph, assuming that the next main idea is in the second paragraph, or the third, or the fourth, and so forth. So if you're writing about two distinct ideas or two distinct subjects and you bundle them in within the single paragraph, one will be lost because they'll jump to the third idea in the second paragraph, if that makes sense. Hmm. So when writing for the web, follow the inverted pyramid, split your ideas into distinct paragraphs, use bullet points, bolding, headings, um, all the good principles of scannability and usability, and in addition to that, um, make sure that um, the article actually delivers on its promise. So that's quite important. Um, now, the final thought, I guess, on how am I different? I really feel like the world doesn't need any more content. There's too much of it already. So there's there's news. News is always useful. Evergreen content is useful. You know how to solve problems, this and that. But I think um, in our landscape in digital marketing, too many people are pumping out content just for the sake of Google rankings or traffic. So they have a weekly schedule. You know, it's Tuesday, so we must publish an article because, you know, we publish articles on Tuesday. My role when I'm writing or when I'm doing work for our clients, write when there's something to write about, not because it's Tuesday and it's your schedule. Um, if we all keep in mind that there's too much content out there and if, there's some, if there is not a good reason to push content out, then there should be no content pushed out. Um, it's as simple as that. So we could talk about this maybe a little bit later. But essentially, before I decide to create a piece of content for my clients, um, that piece of content has to be defended by reason and purpose. Not only newsworthiness, but by the data. How do you find the reason? Because normally, if you have a client, you can't say to him, "It's not. Uh, we're not going to publish anything because I don't think it's anything worthy publishing. It's your purpose and scope to find that and Let's improve say, their rankings and bring more traffic and do all this stuff. How do you research all this stuff and how do you find uh, the exact topic that you're going to going to write? Topics are really hard, and that's you know that's the little bit of sprinkling of the magic comes into that just happens as creativity. But I don't leave things to creativity or chance. Um, a good idea for an article could strike me in a shower while I'm sleeping or uh, driving my car or just completely a random situation. Yeah, I totally to agree, think, but it's not scalable. <laughs> yeah, we sh they should invent like uh, waterproof notepads for your shower. <clears throat> There's a whole subreddit called Shower Thoughts because that's your meditative space. It's it's very rarely that I sit in my office and I say, all right, I'm going to come up with a great article idea for my client. And 
within this half an hour, one hour, I come up with great ideas. I never do. It does, just doesn't happen like that. Creative thought takes time and it's a little bit mysterious to me. So I, I leave that aside. The ideas come to me when they come and I just write them down. Um, but I think the big exercise and the responsibility of a digital marketer is to advise not only on opportunities, but also be able to sort and prioritize um, different activities. And same goes with content. Let's let's take an e-commerce site. You know, these guys are retailing 10,000 different products in 100 different categories from electronics to skincare. And you're trying to decide as a content marketing agency or an SEO, what do we write about next? So your decision could be influenced by maybe something trending um, as piece of news. You spot something interesting being hot on Reddit or um, in Google Trends, although Google Trends is pretty slow capturing hot stuff. Um, so you could be inspired by that. But my process is a much simpler than that. Um, when, when I try to determine what to write about, I look at the search console data and I look at uh, a wide range of keywords, not like 10 arbitrary keywords or maybe 100. I look at the whole 20,000 keywords, if, if such exist. And uh, do you use API with Search Console yourself? Mm, via API? Or, yeah. No, we... we, we... I, I use... Um, I have a tool that does API calls to Search Console, but I primarily, when I'm just doing manual work, I just do CSV exports. The problem with Search Console is that the, the CSV export is limited to a thousand lines. Um, and to get really all the keywords out of uh, the Search Console, you have to do a little bit of a hack. And so what I do is, um, what you will notice is that if you, if you, if you uh, minus your brand, mm -hmm. for example, out of the Search Console, you'll still get thousand keywords export. If you minus letter A, you'll still get 1,000 keywords export. And you mix everything in the end. And so you, you could begin? include, you could do, um, for each letter of the alphabet, you could minus A, minus B, minus C, and in the end, just do uh, a merge command in DOS um, and just merge it on into one, a single CSV file, deduplicate the whole file, and voila, you've got the full range of uh, uh, different queries for, for that particular domain. Now, little hack aside, so you look at those keywords and it's a very long spreadsheet. It doesn't mean anything. You're just looking at keywords, rankings, CTR and so forth. Uh, so for me, the next step is understanding um, what has potential. And I do that in two ways. First is I try to understand if something has potential to get more clicks if it moves up in rank. And I like to calculate how many more clicks will I be getting if something moves up. Certain keyword will move one position up and it'll get 100 extra clicks. The other keyword will get 500 extra clicks if it moves one position up. They're all different. But then goes the difficulty as well for that uh, particular keyword. Um, and also grouping of those keywords and mapping them to different URLs. So one distinct URL could be triggered by 12 different keywords or queries in Google. So what I do is I like to understand the cumulative traffic for every qu uh, query that leads to that particular URL and understand the movement impact on traffic. And that's really easy to calculate. If you understand your CTR distribution curve, 30% for number one position, 20% for two, and so forth. And not by, not by uh, some sort of arbitrary industry standards. Judging by the data of your own website, excluding the branded terms, because your branded terms will have 80% click-through rate and such. Um, that's not to be factored in. So you just look at statistically. If something is on position three, what's the click-through rate? 
So you can now calculate what your um, clicks will be on position two. So that's really, really simple type of work. Understanding uh, how pages will benefit from movement in the rankings. <clears throat> now you suddenly understand which keywords to focus on and which pages to focus, focus on. And most people make a mistake of um, writing more blog content, completely disregarding their commercial landing pages, the quality of content on their product pages or services pages. And I think uh, us as an industry need to focus more on that and less on pumping out more blog stuff um, because that's where the links go towards high quality stuff. Um, and one other exciting thing is uh, in terms of not just content, but also um, general op optimization opportunity is understanding with something has a very bad CTR. Let's say uh, you're a number one position, but your CTR is like 8%. You would want to investigate that. Let's say that that query has 100,000 impressions <laughs> and you're only getting 80,000 uh, clicks on it or like 8,000 clicks on it. It's like really, really low. Um, you would want to investigate that straight away uh, because that's something you're losing traffic on. So content in this case is not the content of the page itself. It's the content of your title and the content of your meta description, which I think need rigorous and ongoing testing process um, until the website is completely satisfied that they've found the optimal title and description for that perfect snippet. Um, and then experimentation with um, schema and uh, other, other mechanisms. One that's recently uh, popped up and is not, I think, not utilized as much as it could be is the featured snippets, the zeroth result. Yeah, a question. Uh, did, you, did you try to do A-B testing on titles? for Absolutely. pages and how did you do it in terms of not affecting the rankings in a negative way on the long term? Well, the solution is simple. You keep you keep your core keywords because we've done the keyword research. We look at our search console data. We know what keywords need to be there. So we're playing with the, all the other factors. So there, are, there are elements of a title tag that will increase the click-through rate without changing impact of the ranking of the main of the primary keyword one example is addition of a price in the title <clears throat> let's take um for example take um a service like cruises cruises to new zealand right so that's a that's a title and ctr is 10 percent suddenly we put cruises to new zealand from $1,600. Suddenly we're seeing 12% click-through rate because we added the price. It could be the other way around. We could have the price in there and the CTR drops because people are like, ah, too expensive, I'm not gonna click on it. It doesn't yeah, matter. It's, it's tricky, it's tricky to, uh, to test because when you change it from cruises to New Zealand and you add the price, for example, your rankings might change also and you, cannot measure the, the CTR correctly. You only, you only the measure the CTR on the, on the average ranking position. Your, the absolute position doesn't exist, we know that. If somebody searches from their mobile phone or tablet or logged in, logged out, if somebody searches from Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, completely different results. Yeah, correct, but it, uh, it's, uh, so you can, uh, you can lose positions and lose from an average of uh, 1.5, for example, to an average of 2.5 or 2. And then the CTR is, you can't, cannot compare the CTR uh, with what you had before because it doesn't make sense. You're on position two in average. So your CTR, ah, normally it's lower. But you still can. Let's say, let's say um, your, your keyword is ranking on position five. It has 10% click-through rate. You change the title tag, the CTR increases but the rank drops. The rank drops to position six. You'd expect 8% click-through rate on your position six, but you're getting 10% click-through rate. That's 2% above the expectation. 
So you can always uh, notice deviation from the norm. So doesn't regardless of what position the keyword is on or the page is on for that particular query, you can always understand how the adjustment in a title has impacted its performance on that particular position. So even if it drops, you can always understand if the CTR has has been increased. Of course, that doesn't help help with the fact that you've dropped the position. Uh, but from 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 what I've been doing, I have rarely seen a drop in the ranking on the basis of adjustment of the title. If you change it completely, you may see, obvi obviously, when you change it, you change it with the intent of increasing the CTR and increasing the ranking. Uh, both might happen or uh, they may, may not. Uh, That's with titles. So with meta descriptions, you can literally do whatever you want and it has absolutely no impact. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the title is what people pay attention to first. That's a given. Um, and in some instances, so price is one. Um, rich snippets is another one. Um, uh, presence of uh, a well-known brand. Sometimes, you know, websites think, well, my brand is in the URL. Why do I need to insert my brand as a variable in all my titles? But for big brands, you know, like, uh, Expedia or Nike or you know if you put the brand in the URL in the um, title that actually adds to the uh, confidence and trust uh, of the user for that uh, particular search snippet so that can be beneficial um, for lesser known brand removing of your own brand could increase um, the click-through rate Did you so effectively so did you try to use also for for A-B testing uh, AdWords, for example, because it's uh, it may be easier to, to test using AdWords and see exactly what is the perfect uh, title and description for, uh, for a page on a specific keyword and then try to apply that on, uh, uh, on the actual ranking page. Yeah, that's what's going on at the moment. So we've got a client who's running a very, very elaborate um, and quite an expensive AdWords campaign with a lot of keyword volume. Um, so they're in an educational space, they're an EDU domain. And we're currently liaising with their PPC department, obtaining all the data and understanding um, not just instances of highly performing CTRs, but we're trying to understand the rules. What in general, increases the CTR. Um, so the next step after that will be if we have a hypothesis, we quickly test it with AdWords. Once it proves successful, we, we again test it in organic. Um, the problem with this is that behavior between organic and AdWords is slightly different. It's not dramatically different, but it is different. So it's good for um, quick hypothesis testing and rolling things out into organic, but the testing must continue in the organic results as well. Um, I don't have a fancy framework for testing at the moment. It's just a Google spreadsheet um, and monitoring the impact of different experiments on the on the CTR. Uh, so combining the, the rank increase and combining the CTR optimization, um, getting getting more traffic to the pages that need uh, uh, that increase in the order of priority, obviously. Um, so where does content come into this? Well, the pages that you've highlighted as the ones with highest potential to grow and bring you clicks. And of course, there's a third layer to the whole research, and that is applying the average conversion rate and the average uh, or the goal value for that particular page or in general. So you can attach monetary reward um, uh, and understand how much more revenue the business will generate in different scenarios, whether it be a, a scenario where we optimize the CTR to be to the click-through rate where we should be, as per the average, or the scenario where we increase the rank or both. Um, and I think that's a nice... 
do you uh, think CTR is a good show to your management? What was that? Do you think CTR is a ranking signal? I, I think you wrote an article in the, uh, or mentioned something, an article in the past about how the user's behavior is a ranking si uh, signal and, click yes, uh, and how click-through yeah. rate is uh, actually an, uh, a ranking factor. Do you still believe this today? Have you, is your opinion changed? There is, no, there is no belief there. This is a well-known fact. And uh, I think Google's been quite... Uh, uh, sneaking the way that uh, they talk about CTR. There is absolutely no sh shadow of a doubt that CTR is a ranking signal. C CTR is not only a ranking signal, CTR is essential to Google's self analytics, I suppose. Uh, it's one of the core um, metrics that Google or, or other search engines use to improve the quality of their search results. And this is not limited to Google. All the other search engines use that as well. Bing and Google did joint research. Microsoft and Google did joint research and Yahoo as well um, to um, understand how uh, position bias impacts the click-through rates. And they did research about how bolding of the keywords that, that match the query on the snippet impacts the user selection and impacts the CTR. So as a result of one of those papers um, and patents as, uh, at a later date, Google removed the bolding of the search terms matching user search query from the title in the snippet. And you remember Google from maybe five, six, seven mm -hmm. years ago? Yeah. The, the keyword was bolded bolded in the title. Two years after that paper came out showing bias in user selection based on the bolding in the title, they actually ended up removing it. Um, so the I think the article I published on Moz, and it was called um, "User Behavior Data as a Ranking Signal." And there's for those who are curious about that, you can Google it and get to that article. It's loaded with proof um, that Google not only uses that but really relies on CTI as one of their essential. Um, uh, quality signals. Now, um, one thing to understand is that Google also owns um, Chrome and that they get uh, a variety of data from Chrome as well. And if you are not convinced, you can simply type in um, Chrome colon forward slash forward slash histograms in your address bar and you will open a file that's been recording everything you've ever done in Chrome including opening tabs, closing tabs, bookmarking, copying URL, starting to type URL, completing the URL, hitting enter, swiping text, tapping, scrolling, everything. So it's a large text file that that's, gets compressed and if you've ticked the box, get sent to Google uh, for quality purposes. Um, so user behavior data is essential to Google self-improvement. Where people get it wrong uh, is where they think that they can uh, go to some website and inflate the click-through rate for that particular page and suddenly expect higher rankings uh, for that website. This is not a real-time signal. Google simply uses it to improve their systems, not to in real-time manipulate the authority of a website, much, much like a link graph would uh, or something like that. Yeah, I've noticed. I've noticed uh, in the past on some black hat boards some uh, uh, negative SEO in terms of uh, clicking the uh, clicking clicking the URLs on uh, on a specific page. Let me give you an example. So there were some ads, uh, so mini ads where people were paid like a few cents for clicking on uh, results pages in for a particular keyword and they, it sounded like they search for this keyword and then go and click on uh, any of the results there uh, except a specific page there which was targeted to be delisted from the top 10 and uh, when you click on the on the results that you chosen go and scroll and navigate inside the inside the page so practically they were doing negative seo to a particular page 
and that page didn't see anything coming so they didn't see any click anything and uh, doing this consistently they practically were able to manipulate the rankings and drop the uh, drop that that page or set of pages from the from the top 10 what do you think about this have you seen this in the wild have you do you have any more information you want to share with us about this technique i'm skeptical simply because uh, black hats are not really known as scientific types who will document document their uh, testing process and um, they want the results to be true so they are true in their findings yeah yeah um, they were paying they were paying for for the stuff to be and and i can tell you that i saw on on the boards on black hat boards um, this kind of announcements on a variety of keywords both for uh, negative seoing and also for uh, f uh, there were ads like go to this particular page and practically they were improving the improving the rankings for a particular page by doing the same thing go to this page search for this go to this page click inside the uh, inside the page start navigating and uh, that's it your job is done you can get your uh, i don't know two cents five cents whatever they were they were paying for this in order to increase the ctr but also show to google that um, there was activity on that particular browsing browsing session and this was done for months continuously uh, depending on the budgets of the people that were uh, trying to manipulate so here's the thing um, for for the last two years I haven't been as prolific with my writing and sharing and this and that I've been busy but um, I haven't stopped experimenting and one of my experiment one of my experiments uh, was with Mechanical Turk and I'm talking large numbers of Mechanical Turk users in an attempt to use user selection to attempt to manipulate the results. I've ran the tests persistently, continuously on a large number of users for different pages and different um, queries and I haven't seen any impact. Now I have been using Mechanical Turk, so um, that's perhaps the weakness of this experiment. Um, it was cheap to run, but they may have been known IP addresses and you know, uh, but for what it's worth, there was a, a, a large group of users participating in the experiment and I haven't seen anything interesting other than the data showing up in the search console. <laughs> um, so the only thing I've actually manipulated was the key queries in the search console and the click to rate for that particular test query. So it's worked, Google's bought it and they've, it's speaked and I, um, I see it in there, but it has done absolutely nothing, not only in terms of the rankings, but also hasn't done anything in terms of Google Suggest or the re related queries at the bottom of search results, which was part of my test as well. I was trying to manipulate the Google Suggest for some uh, certain queries mm -hmm. and it, uh, it, hasn't, uh, it hasn't worked. So you're saying that some people claim success on this? Yeah, on manipulating the Google Suggest in the past, but I don't recall yeah. how the exact suggest uh, suggest that uh, they manipulated. But it was uh, newsworthy. I think it, uh, sites yeah. wrote about uh, the manipulation. I think there was something also in Romania done by someone, and it was acknowledged that uh, yeah, that result shouldn't be shouldn't be there in the suggest. I mean, it didn't make sense to be to be there. But it was a couple of years ago, so maybe now Google has their algorithms better, for sure. But yeah, I'm, I'm sure they're improving because they've got a whole team um, yeah. in charge of the Suggest. Um, but I, I know that Suggest can be manipulated, um, but it, it takes really large volumes of people to trigger it. It depends on what you're trying to manipulate, probably, because if there are, if there are queries which have low volume, then uh, Google should uh, relate to that low 
lower volume, not like uh, trying to uh, trying to manipulate for a keyword like CNN. If you're trying to manipulate for a keyword which has a couple of uh, hundreds of uh, searches per, per month, maybe you have more more chances there. But let's talk about something that works for you now. What SEO technique is working for, for, for you now exactly? And if you can share some of the technicalities about, uh, about it. Yeah. Um, I'm generally internally criticized within the company, criticized for oversharing. And, uh, and we have one particular method that's working rather well. But my guys uh, have asked me to embargo the method so we can milk the benefits for a year or two. Okay, um, so but I will not keep it. I will not keep it uh, a complete uh, secret. I think it's in essence it's the problem uh, that we're consistently finding with all our uh, corporate clients. And so this is t typically large websites that have very successful blogs, high domain authority, and what's happening is that. These websites have all their link equity is coming from blogs and news and whatnot to their blog content, which is great, high quality uh, pages. But if you look at their uh, money pages, zero links because they're just boring. There's absolutely yeah. nothing of value on the pages. So if you're selling cars, you know, if you're a Toyota website and that's your, you know, uh, latest model, so you've got your specifications and this and that, but other than that, there's nothing, nothing on it. The, I think the worst case I've seen was uh, a website that was selling uh, car seat covers. How boring is that, you know? It's a seat cover, you wrap it on your seat and that's that. Um, so currently we're busy with working with our clients money pages and improving the content and linkability of those pages. Um, something, this is not a new thing for us. It's working really well, but it's not a new thing. We've had attempts in the past. Um, one of the methods was to run a competition page, not on the separate competition page, but on the page of the product that you're giving away. So let's say you're selling glasses and this is the model of the glasses and you're and you're uh, giving away 10 pairs in the next month to the lucky winners. Don't create a separate competition page. Create a competition page on the glasses page itself of the product you're giving away. It could be on a separate tab or an accordion or whatever mechanism to structure it so it's not detracting from the purchase. But if people land on that competition page, hash competition at the end of the URL, jumps straight to the competition rules so you it's time to announce the winners what do you do do you send them to the winners page no you don't you show the winners on the page again where you're selling the glasses the page where the glass can be purchased from um, so you see how we're reusing the main product page not only in terms of improving the content that's what i'm doing now but the old method was to create publicity interest for the landing page itself. Um, so that's one nice method that um, works and people are just ignoring it. So you try to incentivize uh, in any way the link acquisition? So basically, you know, we'll try to generate links, but links to land commercial landing pages are really hard. Uh, so that's the problem we're solving at the moment. We're working towards increasing the quality of the content to such a point by using data, statistics, new research, really useful stuff, tools, tables, downloadables, um, really, you know, reaching the pinnacle of usefulness for the product page or the service page to such, to such a level that you can actually do outreach for that page and a blogger might actually link to it because there's something of such high value on that page um, that they find it uh, very useful. The problem that I've run into when doing this, when working on the high, highest possible quality landing pages is that they tend to be quite big. 
and there's a lot of stuff going on and that tends to detract from the purchasing part so we've got a problem now uh, we're trying to create a linkable asset that's our landing page which would otherwise be a blog post a completely irrelevant page to which we don't need links but the other hand at the other hand we want our conversion rate to be very high and if you have too many distracting elements your conversion rate will drop every every next element you add is one more point against your conversion so uh, like I mentioned earlier utilization of tabs and accordions and other devices to structure the layout um, is helpful in this context except Google's desktop index is still being funny about tabs and accordions and such devices anything contained within the tab or accordion will be indexed but not ranking so you could literally and I did this experiment um, I published a post, a post on Moz and then I copied that post on my own web website Moz is high authority mine is low authority but I did one thing I expanded every hidden content on my version and Moz's blog post had little click clickable elements to expand the bits and pieces guess who ranked first for the expandable pieces me no. for essentially duplicate content so essentially what's happening right now is landing pages for very important products that contain information behind a tab or an accordion or otherwise hiding hiding element that content will not rank at all in fact scrapers dirty scrapers with low domain authority will outrank it if they display that um, content on default so that's something to keep in mind mobile not a problem uh, Gary Ilyash John Mueller have said that they don't have a problem with hiding elements of content on mobile uh, devices that's good user experience and Google uses accordions themselves in the search results as related questions and I cannot fathom the hypocrisy of it because they're punishing webmasters for utilizing such elements by not ranking that content yet they're empl employing that piece of uh, user experience themselves um, so mobile first fine desktop not so fine so you've got that issue of conversion optimization versus content richness and that's something that we're currently working on okay what do you think uh, uh, is a top mistake that uh, SEO people are doing uh, nowadays, nowadays. <laughs> writing useless content on the blog more blog posts let's let's uh let's build some links for that stuff okay yeah i think uh and i, I think another thing is chasing links ignoring the technical at seo basics like what we've discussed earlier um optimizing your click to rate improving your titles and descriptions that's one of the most basic seo things people completely ignore how hard do you think is SEO now compared to three years ago? Three years, ago, three years ago, not so different, but five, six years ago, yeah, quite different. Um, How much? Twice? I think it's 50%, 50% completely changed. And I think there's no, lo there's no longer a choice for, for an SEO has to become a digital marketer. Um, internally within our team we've completely blended for example we've completely blended the social social ads in SEO process to, to the point where my um, um, accounts lady is asking us is this invoice towards the paid or organic and we say what's the difference so when when we form a digital strategy um, our ads could be serving to increase awareness of a piece of content that could lead to links um, internally we call it micro targeting um, basically uh, I know it's a little bit of a bad bad timing for this topic but effectively we have been using Facebook to micro target specific users to influence their uh, opinion and try to make them right about our clients yeah. targeting people at uh, certain newspapers or you know 
in, in, in government or other areas, bloggers. Did you also example. try LinkedIn? Because LinkedIn as a professional network for, for this kind of people can be used in the same way. I have tried too expensive. Yeah, that's the problem with LinkedIn that I've uh, noticed has and heard. Extraordinary targeting. I love what LinkedIn's done with targeting. Um, arguably works better than Facebook um, for certain industries and obviously not for your moms and dads and common, but for pre- professional world and services and such, very good targeting. I find um, I found myself surprised with Twitter. Twitter served a great purpose for my SEO projects. Imagine, imagine getting links to your client's content without doing manual link outreach. How nice is that? I'm not saying I, I can get that every time and in large volumes, but if you structure an advertising campaign in the right way to send bloggers and journalists to the content, if the content is good enough, if the topic is good enough, it will be picked up. So effectively, you're, ba- you're buying impressions, you're buying clicks, you're paying for that part, and it's up to the journalist or blogger to link to that piece of content if they find it link worthy enough. So that's where the content quality comes into place. And if your content piece is 5,000 words of boring stuff and you don't get to the point and it's all hard to read, it's a wall of text and you've blended everything, they're just going to leave. Um, so if you've got something newsworthy, useful, um, really valuable um, and re- really easy to digest, and you've sent to the blogger or journalist to that page at the right time. Uh, you know, you didn't catch them too late or too early in the day and they're just about writing about something like that and they're like, oh, that's really useful. So that, that's really hard. But it's even harder if you're doing manual begging, link begging. Can yeah. you please mind? That's really nasty work. Nobody likes to do that. So I guess I'm trying to pioneer a technique and, and trying to perfect the technique of uh, micro-targeting or influences through advertising um, in an attempt to get high quality content, the exposure it needs to be picked up on an organic level. So I'm paying money, getting links, but not breaching Google's guidelines. Yeah, smart. What do you think uh, when people are choosing an SEO agency to work with, what they should be pay attention to? and uh, what they should uh, avoid in terms of what the agency is saying. Avoid smoke and mirrors, avoid vague language. If you, if you don't understand what an SEO is saying to you, if they can't explain it to you like a five-year-old, I just remembered uh, AJ Conan, uh, blind five-year-old, that's the whole point. Um, if you can't exp- if you can't understand what your SEO is saying to you, don't sign up. If if an SEO agency is explaining your strategy to you or their approach, it it has to make perfect sense. The communication from then during that initial proposal process has to be crystal clear. It has to make business sense. It has to make uh, it has to have passed that logic, uh, basic logic reasonable man test and uh, if it's all too vague and if they're using just jargon if they if their excuses for low performance of the campaign is like oh algorithms and this and that and they're trying to put too many things in there stay away a good seo agency will explain everything black and white and they'll they'll explain what's possible what's not where's the area of opportunity where there's not um recently to most of my new clients, I've explained that everything we do will be a test. We'll try this. We'll put $5,000 into this idea. And we'll let you know if it works or it doesn't. That's the best an SEO can do. We do not control Google. We do not know what's going to happen. We're the weatherman. We can see what's going on in the landscape there. and we can, we can see it might rain, but we cannot make it rain. And that's the big difference. An SEO that promises the rain <clears throat> is a crook. Yeah, unfortunately, there are a lot of uh, 
SEOs that uh, did this in the past and probably still do it, and SEO got a bad name during this uh, process of evolution. Okay, what do you think as a last question is the next step for Google? What's the next uh, algorithm? What's the next uh, area they will focus on when, uh, with, uh, with big changes? We recall uh, penguins, pandas, what do you think is coming next of such a big uh, impact, if there is anything coming next, in your opinion? We understand that um, Google is at this point <clears throat> beyond what I would describe as petty human tweaks. There might be new engineering ideas and new concepts introduced to the Google's algorithms, but we're beyond that point where human input is the most relevant thing. We already know that Google's let the machine make up its own mind about whether a website is of a high quality or a low quality, whether a content piece is valuable or not, whether it's authoritative or not. In the age of unsupervised machine learning, we have absolutely no control. And what we're going to be seeing is machines teaching machines and self-improving and self-improving and user behavior data will be uh, valuable, traffic will be valuable, um, your external marketing tactics will be valuable, branding will be super important, understanding uh, when somebody is notable and, and significant will be important. So I think an SEO needs to look at all the other channels employing a sound marketing strategy in order to persuade Google's AI, essentially, that this domain is, or brand, is of significance and authority. Um, there will be less and less room for these manipulative signals that we're so used to, including links. Links are still the backbone of, of Google and how Google works, but they've given reins to um, machine learning and that's, that's game over for little tricks and tweaks and this and that. I think we're going to see more and more uh, reliance on Google's engineering end to, to machine learning. And we're going to see a lot more intelligence out of Google. In fact, there's an article that I wrote maybe in 2015 that predicts the entire timeline of Google going from a basic search engine to becoming our assistant, uh, to be able to write its own content, advise, represent us in court uh, as our legal representation and uh, yeah, it's quite an interesting um, projection. I'll try to dig up that link and um, share it with you so you can uh, share with the rest of your uh, viewers. I think uh, it'll be quite interesting to see if I'm still on, on the money with my prediction so far because we're in 2018 now. Um, be mm -hmm. interesting to see how accurate I was. I was overly optimistic. We're not at the Skynet level yet, but um, we're getting there. <laughs> we're getting there in about 10 years. <laughs> yeah, we're getting there. What I would love to see is one proper competitor to Google, whether it be Amazon or eBay or a new search engine or you know even Facebook. Um, I'd love to see a proper competitor in terms of, you know, information retrieval and, and, and uh, presentation to, um, to users. Maybe it comes out of China or Russia, I don't know. But I would really love for it to exist soon. I'm yeah. waiting for that nice surprise. Let's make a prediction. In the next five years, somebody will come to the world stage and completely surprise us with a um, uh, disruptive search engine and artificial intelligence technology, uh, perhaps based on uh, uh, quantum uh, computing, qubits, not zeros and ones. Yeah, problem is Google is highly investing in quantum computing. They are. <laughs> I hope it's not Google. I hope it's, uh, and I love Google guys, they send me gifts. Yeah, like, yeah, I see. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I, I think there needs to be good competition and that's a good thing for Google and good thing for users if there's proper competition uh, to Google. So they're not driven just by their shareholders, but by 
pure competition. I think we need, we need a new, just like Russia and America need a new space race, we need a search engine race to start again. Yeah. Thank you very much for uh, a lot of questions with our audience. Do you want to add anything uh, else or end this uh, interview with a specific uh, thing in mind for our audience? You know what they say, when you do a talk, uh, tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. So let's do that last part then. So remember, when you're writing for the web, start with the basics, get to the point, go into the further detail and all the fluff at the end. Split your ideas into multiple paragraphs. Work your highest possible quality content towards your landing pages, commercial landing pages based on the data and the data is driven from the search console and all your opportunities and potential is there. Look at your CTRs, look at your um, authority optimization opportunities based on traffic growth and CTR optimization. Keep testing, keep experimenting. You are not just an SEO, you're a digital marketer. Employ every channel. That's all I have to say. Okay, thank you very much, Dan been an absolute pleasure. I look forward to joining you again and at some other time. Bye-bye.